Hello, we're going to be reading the second chapter of Soshenka now. For those of you that have listened to the first guided reading, you will have met the governess, Lala, the driver, Pantamillion, and you will be aware of the fact that they're waiting to collect Shoshenka from the Institute for Noble Girls, the boarding school. Their term is finishing early because of World War I. Russia cannot afford, well, it can't afford to do many things, but one of which is funding the boarding school, so feeding the girls, heating the dormitories, etc. There was a bit of confusion, though, because there are three political policemen outside the Institute for Noble Girls, and people are confused as to why these policemen are there, what business they would have outside this boarding school. Now we are going to find out why they are there, and we are going to meet Shashenka in Chapter 2. It was the last class, sewing for the Tsar and Motherland. Sashenka pretended to stitch the khaki breeches, but she could not concentrate and kept pricking her thumb. The bell was about to ring, releasing her and the other girls from their 18th century prison, with its drafty dormitories, echoing refectories and alabaster ballrooms. Sashenka decided that she would be the first to curtsy to the teacher, and therefore first out of the classroom. She always wanted to be different, either the first or the last, but never in the middle so she sat at the very front, nearest the door. She felt she had grown out of the small knee. Sashenka had more serious matters on her mind than the follies and frivolities of the other schoolgirls, in what she called the Institute for Noble Imbeciles. They talked of nothing but the steps of obscure dances, the cotillion, the pas de Spagne, the pas de patineur, the trion and the chicone, their latest love letters from Misha or Nikolasha in the guards, the modern style for ball dresses, and most particularly, how to present their decolletage. They discussed this endlessly with Sashenka after lights out because she had the fullest breasts in her class. They said they envied her so much. Their shallowness not only appalled, but embarrassed her because, unlike the others, she had no wish to flaunt her breasts. Sashenka was 16, and she reminded herself, no longer a girl. She loathed her school uniform, her plain white dress made of cotton and muslin, with its twee pinafore and a starch shoulder cape, which made her look young and innocent. Now she was a woman, and a woman with a mission. Yet despite her secrets, she could not help but crave her darling Lala waiting outside in her father's laundrette with the English biscuits on the back seat. The staccato clap of Maman Sokolov, all the teachers had to be dressed as Maman, broke into Shoshenka's daydreams. Short and lumpy with fuzzy hair, Maman boomed in her resounding bass. Ladies, time to collect up your sewing. I hope you have worked well for our brave soldiers, who are sacrificing their lives for our motherland and his imperial majesty, the emperor. That day, sewing for the Tsar, for Tsar and motherland had meant attaching a newfangled luxury, zippers, to breeches for the Russia's long-suffering peasant conscripts who were being slaughtered in their thousands under Nicholas II's command. This task inspired much breathless giggling among the schoolgirls. Take special care, Maman Sokolov had warned, with this sensitive work. A badly sewn zipper could in itself be an added peril for the Russian warrior already beset by danger. Is it where he keeps his rifle? Sashenko had whispered to the girl next to her. The other girls had heard, had heard her and laughed. None of them were sewing very carefully. The day seemed interminable. Lean and hours had passed since breakfast in the main hall, and the obligatory curtsy to the huge canvas of the emperor's mother, the dowager empress Maria Fordanova, with her gimlet eyes and shrewish mouth. Once the eel zipper trousers were collected, Maman Sokolov again clapped her hands. A minute until the bell! Before you go, mon enfance, I want the best curtsy of the term, and a good curtsy is a... Low curtsy, cried the girls, laughing. Oh yes, my noble ladies, for the curtsy, mon enfance, low is for noble girls. You'll notice that the higher lady stands on the table of ranks granted to us by the first emperor, Peter the Great, the lower she curtsies when she is presented to their imperial majesties. Hit the floor. When she said low, Maman Sokolov's voice plunged to ever more profound depths. Shop girls make a little curtsy, comsa, and she did a little dip, at which Shoshenka caught the eyes of the others and tried to conceal a smile. 
but ladies go low. Touch the ground with your knees, girls. Come sa. And Momo Sokolov curtsied with surprising energy, so low that her cross knees almost touched the wooden floor. Who's first? Me! Sushenka was already up, holding her engraved calf leather case and her canvas bag of books. She was so keen to leave that she gave the lowest and most aristocratic curtsy she had ever managed. Lower even than, than the one she had given to the Dowager Empress on St Catherine's Day. Merci, Momo, she said. Behind her, she heard the girls whisper in surprise, for she was usually the rebel of the class. But she did not care any more, not since the summer. The secrets of those hazy summer nights had shattered and recast everything. The bell was ringing and Shoshenka was already in the corridor. She looked around at its high moulded ceilings, shiny parquet and the electric glare of the chandeliers. She was quite alone. Her satchel, engraved in gold with her full name, Baroness Alexandra Zeitlin, was over her shoulder, but her most treasured possession was in her hands an ugly canvas book bag that she hugged to her breast. In it were precious volumes of Zola, Zola's realist novel, Nekrasov's bleak poetry, and the passionate defiance of Mayakovsky. She started to run down the corridor towards Grandma who was silhouetted against the lamps of limousines and the press of governesses and coachmen, all waiting to collect the noble young ladies of the Smolny. But it was too late. The doors along the corridor burst open and suddenly it was flooded with laughing girls in white dresses with white lacy pinafores, white stockings and soft white shoes. Like an avalanche of powdery snow, they flowed down the corridor towards the cloakrooms. Coming the other way, the herd of heavy-hooved coachmen, their long white beards with hoarfrost and bearing the freezing northern night in their cloaks, trudged forward to collect the girls' trunks. Resplendent in his flashy uniform with its peaked cap, Pantamelian stood among them, staring at Shoshenka as if in a trance. Pantamelian! Oh, Mademoiselle Zeitlin! He shook himself and reddened. What could have embarrassed the lady killer of the servants' quarter? she wondered, smiling at him. Yes, it's me. My trunk and valise are in dormitory 12, by the window. Wait a minute. Is that a new uniform? Yes, mademoiselle. Who designed it? Your mother, Baroness Zeitlin. He called after her as he lumbered up the stairs to the dormitories. What had he been staring at, Shishenka asked herself. Was it her horrible bosom or over-wide mouth? She turned uneasily towards the cloakroom. After all, what was appearance? The shallow realm of schoolgirls. Appearance was nothing compared to history, art, progress and fate. She smiled to herself, mocking her mother's scarlet and gold taste. Pantamelian's garish uniform made it obvious that the Zeitlins were nouveau riche. Shoshenka was first into the cloakroom. Filled with the silky furs of animals, brown, golden and white, coats, shapkas and stoles with the faces of snow foxes and mink, the room seemed to be breathing like the forests of Siberia. She pulled on her fur coat, wrapped her white fox stole around her neck and the white oran bog shawl around her head and was already heading for the door when the other girls poured in, homebound, their faces flushed and smiling. They threw down shoes, slipped on little boots and galoshes, unclipped leather satchels and bundled themselves into fur coats, all the time chattering, chattering. Captain de Parlin's back from the front. He's paying a visit to Mama and Papa, but I know he's coming to see me, said little Countess Elena to her wide-eyed companions. He's written me a letter. Sashenka was almost out of the room when she heard several girls calling to her. Where was she going? Why was she in such a hurry? Couldn't she wait for them? What was she doing later? If you're reading, can we read poetry with you? Please, Sashenka. The end-of-term crowd was already pushing, shoving through the door. A schoolgirl cursed a sweating old coachman who, carrying a trunk, had trodden on her foot. Freezing outside, it was feverishly hot in the hall. Yet even here, Sashenka felt herself quite separate surrounded by an invisible barrier that no one could cross, as she heaved her canvas bag, coarse against the lushness of her furs, against her over her shoulder. She thought she could feel the different books inside, the anthologies of Bloch and Balmont, the novels of Anatole France and Victor Hugo. Mademoiselle Zeitlin, enjoy your holidays, Grandma half blocking the door doorway, declared fruit fruitily. Shoshenka managed a mercy and a curtsy, not low enough to impress Maman Sokolov, Finally, she was outside. 
The stinging air refreshed and cleansed her, burning her lungs deliciously as the oblique snow nipped her cheeks. The lamps of the cars and carriages created a theatre of light twenty feet high but no more. Above her, the savage, boundless sky was Petrograd black, tempered with specks of white. The laundrette is over there, Pantomelian, bearing an Asprey travelling trunk over his shoulder and a crocodile skin valise in his hand, gestured across the drive. Sushanka pushed through the crowd towards the car. She knew that whatever happened, war, revolution, apocalypse, her Lala would be waiting with her Huntley and Palmer's biscuits and maybe even an English ginger cake. And soon she would see her papa too. When a valet dropped his bags, she leaped over them. When when the way was blocked by a, hulk, a hulking rolls with a grand ducal crest on its glossy flank, Sushenka simply opened the door, jumped in and climbed out the other side. Engines chortled and groaned, horns hooted, horses whinnied and stamped their hooves, servants tottered under pyramids of trunks and cases, and cursing coachmen and chauffeurs tried to find a route through the traffic, pedestrians and grimy ice. It was as though an army was breaking camp, but it was an army commanded by generals in white pinafores, chinchilla stoles and mink coats. Shashenka, over here! Lala was standing on the car's running board, waving frantically. Lala, I'm coming home, I'm free! For a moment, Shashenka forgot that she was a serious woman with a mission in life and no time for fripperies or sentimentality. She threw herself into Lala's arms and then into the car, inhaling its reassuring aroma of treated leather and the Englishwoman's floral perfume. Where are the biscuits? On the seat, darling. You survived the term, said Lala, hugging her tightly. You've grown so much, I can't wait to get you home. Everything's ready in the little salon, scones, ginger cake and tea. Now you can have the Huntley and Palmers. But just as she opened her arms to release Sushenka, a shadow fell across her face. Alexandra Sumyalovna Zaitlin. A gendarme stood on either side of the car door. Yes, said Sushenka. She felt a little dizzy suddenly. Come with us said one of the gendarmes. He was standing so close that she could see the pores of his pockmarked skin and the hairs of his ginger moustache. Now, 